Welcome to Experimental, the science show where soldiers wee on their food, eyes explode, and ducks talk. up, why drinking and mobile phones don't mix in Finland, how Boeing is going to have to rely on paper plane fanatics to design their next airliner, and how this man can open a van with his head from 80 metres. But first, Experimental has come to Natek, Massachusetts to meet a man who thinks that this strange collection of stuff is the greatest food on Earth. He's one of the US Army's top food scientists, and he's kind of proud of what he does, as you're about to see. Hi, I'm Jerry Dosh, the director of the Department of Defense Combat Feeding System. Uh, what that fancy title means is that I'm actually the chief cook and bottle washer for the United States Department of Defense. At the moment, we have about 1.2 million warfighters uh, who consume and use the products we have. Uh, they all carry weapons, uh, so it's in our best interest not to antagonize them. In today's battlefield, we have really three uh, combat ration platforms. One is the individual combat ration platform. I'm sure a lot of you folks are familiar with the meal ready to eat or MRE. Uh, not too long ago, that stood for meals rejected by everybody. We have now taken that MRE to meals relished by everyone. Uh, what you see here is a ration that we entitled Unitized Group Ration Express. Basically, it's a kitchen in a carton. It requires no fuel, no cook, and no equipment. All you do is pull a tab, there's an exothermic reaction that generates a lot of heat, and you have a piping hot meal for 18 soldiers anywhere in the battlefield, no matter how remote they are. Uh, we also have a special purpose ration, which we currently uh, field for our uh, reconnaissance pilots, very high altitude missions, and these particular products are used uh, in through the mask feeding through a pressurized helmet. Apart from being high tech and possibly low cuisine, there is one thing that all these foods have in common. They're all heavy and most of their weight comes from this stuff, water. In fact, the water content of a standard issue three meal ration weighs about the same as an M16 rifle. Which is why Jerry and his friends have come up with this, Ration X. Freeze dried food which you can rehydrate with this. Yes, nasty, dirty, brackish water. The kind more deadly than enemy fire. Unfortunately, this grunt wimped out when it came to the eating bit, but Jerry has faith in his science, so let's see him try. And we would take some water that does not look particularly appealing, and we would fill the pouch up to about here. That's basically what the product would look like, and what I'd like to do is open this up and dump it in this bowl. Okay, we're gonna put this down. And as we say in the uh, Department of Defense here in the Combat Feeding Program in Natick, the proof is in the pudding. Mm. Delicious. Mm. Mm. Heaven. Okay, he didn't drop dead, but why? It's all to do with a membrane that separates the food from the dirty water. It's full of holes less than two nanometers wide much smaller than the smallest bacteria and viruses, but larger than a water molecule. Which means water can get through, but the nasties cannot. That's all very well when the grunts are fighting near water. But what if they're out in the desert? Yep, you've guessed it. If you get really, really desperate, you can occasionally use your own personal source of water to rehydrate your meal. But we don't suggest you make a habit of it. Still to come on experimental, funny walks in Finland, the ultimate paper plane in Nottingham, and why chewing gum blocks up the toilets. But first, to the test department for some heady science. Our test department team are always thinking of new and exciting ways to make life easier for themselves, or ideally, effort-free. 
And Horace here was struck the other day by a crucial and important laziness issue. How can you lock your car when you're too far away to use the bleeper thing? You can't imagine what he tried rather than walking the 50 feet back to the car. But eventually he came up with putting the bleepy thing against his head. What? It can't be true. Well, let's see. At 45 feet away, we can see the efficiency of the bleepy thing has dropped right off. We call this the no bleep zone. But using his bleep through the head system, we can push the boundaries of the no bleep zone right back to an amazing 25 metres. Um, why? Well, it seems to have to do with radio waves. The bleeper sends out a stream of them, and Horace thinks that if he can increase the size of the aerial, he can increase the bleeper's range. His theory is that putting the transmitter onto his head results in an aerial exactly one Horace bigger. He's also tried to improve his radio reception by sticking its aerial in his mouth. He swears this works, but we remain suspicious of his theories. Later on Experimental, the test department will be firing eyeballs. But first, let's head north to sunny Finland. Welcome to Finland and the northern town of... Thank you. In the summer, this place is a beach resort, but in winter it gets so cold, the sea freezes. You'd have to be mad to be outside on a day like this. But when we heard that somebody here had invented a device that was set to eradicate mobile phone theft forever, and that they were using vodka in their research, oh well, we were here in a shot. Strictly in the name of science, of course. Professor Heike Alisto is an expert in identification, but his latest invention doesn't use traditional biometrics like fingerprints or iris scans. Instead, it measures gait, the way that we walk. Theft of mobile phones is a big problem. For example, in UK, 5% of all thefts are mobile phone related. And that's what Heike is trying to combat by using a new kind of biometrics, measuring the way people walk. The idea is a simple one. Your phone sits in your pocket or bag as normal but it constantly monitors your movements as you go about your everyday life. It learns how you move. So if someone steals your phone, the phone will know it's not you and will lock up. We grabbed the idea and we started working on a very small, small scale uh, test or experiment to see if it really works. Heike's latest prototype makes use of a tiny motion sensor. Once fitted inside a mobile phone body, it measures movement in three directions. Side to side, that's the yellow line. Up and down, the red line. And forward and back, the green line. And it actually works, as Heidi here will demonstrate. The invention is designed to make a detailed record of every stride, bob and sway of the hips as we make our way around the world. This profile of Heidi's walking style is as individual to her as her voice. Imagine that I'm, I'm a robber, I have stolen Heidi's phone, I have it here, and I, now I'm going to walk with this phone. As soon as he starts walking, the phone detects that Heidi's gait is different from Heidi's, and within a few paces, it switches off. The reason that everyone's walk is so individual is down to the large number of factors that shape our movements. For a start, the size and shape of our skeletons, what sex we are, the size and makeup of our muscles, and even psychology comes into play. 
it seems that happy people really do walk with a spring in their step. Heike's invention is still at the prototype stage, although it's being extensively tested and the results are looking promising. They have found that under extreme conditions, like walking on ice, the phone does tend to think you're a robber, a bit of a drawback, especially if you live here. So the phone now features a pin code that you can input to unlock the phone and reassure it that it really is you. Something else that completely confuses the phone is alcohol. It seems that after a few drinks, we don't just forget ourselves, we forget how to walk like ourselves too. And when you're especially tired and emotional, you might even forget the pin code. Quite a severe design fault, you must admit. Currently, the system knows only one walking style per person, but you could uh, teach the system to learn you your walking style when you are, uh, well, have, when you, you have had a couple of drinks. This is just the beginning for Heike and his team. What started out as an unusual idea has grown into something that they really believe will cut crime. Yeah, we are very excited about this. It's not only mobile phones you, you, we have been talking, but it could be uh, laptops, any gadget you are carrying with you. So, can anything portable be protected by this system? <laughs> Perhaps not. Still to come on Experimental, we have Dr Quack and her microphone, and Professor Macintosh and his paper planes. But before all that, a cautionary tale from the test department. We've all heard the old wives' tale. If you sneeze with your eyes open, They'll pop out. But is there any truth in it? In the test department, our demonstrator is trying to make himself sneeze using pollen and pepper. Sneezing can also be caused by a bright light and even orgasms. But we're not going to go there. Which brings us back to that main question. What would happen if you didn't close your eyes when you sneezed? Time for a little experiment. Unfortunately, we can't do the obvious thing and pin his eyes open. Health and safety, apparently. So we'll do the next best thing. We'll use a fake head and ping-pong balls for the eyes. The idea is simple. Push the ping-pong balls into the pipes, which will act as eye sockets. Then use a foot pump to recreate the pressures that build up inside your nose and throat when you sneeze. So let's see what happens. One problem, though. Very luckily, there are no tubes connecting the back of your eye sockets to your nose and throat. So no matter how hard you sneeze, your eyeballs can never do this. In a moment, we head to Nottingham to learn how to design an airliner. But before we do, some reassuring advice for anyone actually thinking of flying in one. Welcome to the world's worst flying nightmare. You're at 9,000 metres, and suddenly, some nutter decides to open the door. Within a second, you're sucked out into oblivion. Could this really happen? The answer is no. Let's go back to the ground, and our nutter is waiting by the closed door. The pressure inside and outside the plane is roughly the same. But as the plane rises, the pressure outside drops. At 9,000 metres, the higher pressure inside the cabin seals the door into the fuselage, wedging it with a force equivalent to 5,000 kilograms. Which means there's no way any nutter could ever pull it open. Happy flying. Now it's time for some aeronautical engineering. Don't tell this lot they're making paper plates. To them, this is advanced applied paper-formed aeronautics. What you're looking at are the aeronautical engineers of the future, a group of students who have just entered a paper plane-making competition. 
Well, we all have to start somewhere. They learnt their crimping skills at the University of Leeds under the watchful eye of Andrew McIntosh, Professor of Thermodynamics and Combustion Theory. That's burning stuff to you lot. What they did was make their paper aeroplanes with some of the aeronautical principles which there are in aeroplane making. This, this little paper aeroplane is actually flying by exactly the same principles as your big jumbo jets crossing the Atlantic. But will advanced engineering knowledge, when applied to the humble paper plane, get you something better than your average classroom dart? Visually, it seems we're onto a winner here. You get models like the Spruce Moose, the Hornet, and the Mighty Avenger, winner of the competition's prize for the best design. And there's also this one, which looks a bit like the sort of thing I made in class. But why do planes or paper darts fly in the first place? First up, there's the wings. On fancy planes, they're called aerofoils. But you may have noticed that paper planes usually have flat wings. Ooh. They fly in a much simpler manner. The angle of the flat wing deflects the air downwards. This means that the wing and anything attached to it, like a plane, for instance, is pushed upwards. Action and reaction, simple but effective. Want to know what it feels like? Stick your hand out of a car window like this. But real planes, and some of the more complex designs flown in the competition, seem to have all sorts of things dangling off their wings. Ailerons and other devices on aeroplanes are very simple uh, things, really, to understand. Most wings have flaps, which increase the lift when the aircraft is at low speed. There are other devices called ailerons, which help turn the airplane. And on some aircraft, there are additional winglets at the tips, which improve the overall efficiency of the wing. This picture shows hooded cranes in flight, and they've got little winglets which reduce drag at the side. These actually are great designs, which, of course, the great designer has already put there in nature. And uh, we can do well to actually copy those designs. But does it all work? Just because it's got a complex design, does it mean it'll fly better? Let's see how the Avenger, with its flaps and winglets, does. A staggering 2.09 seconds. Next, it's the Hornet. Going for maximum climb and recording a gravity-defying 3.5 seconds. Finally, the Spruce Moose. Nothing fancy here, just a common classroom dart and... Whoa, an amazing 5.3 seconds, which is only 22 seconds off the world record, but proof that when it comes to making paper planes, a simple design wins out every time. Unless somebody really knows what they're doing with these flaps and ailerons, they're going to very quickly move into regions where, rather than being a help, the, the flaps and the ailerons and all the other things, uh, the winglets, are probably going to reduce the amount of forward speed. And it's the forward speed that is vital to keep the plane going for as long as possible. So for competitions like the one we had, it's hardly surprising that it was the simple ones which actually were the ones which were more successful. Um, I came up with this design based on something which I got taught in my secondary school quite a few years back. And um, it, it was the best design that we've found so far. We tried a lot, but disrupt. Well, there you have it. A functional, simple design, well built, can still beat a complex design. Before we talk to some ducks in Italian, let's go to the test department for a spot of mastication. This scientist is performing a very important experiment here in our test lab. She's trying to find out the truth behind the old wives' tale that chewing gum takes seven years to be digested. But luckily, she won't be doing the digestion herself. She's going to create her own stomach right here in the lab. 
So what's in there that does our digesting for us? Well, first up, there are enzymes like pepsin. Then there's hydrochloric acid, which just helps things along. So let's see what these two chemicals do to a little sponge cake. In three hours, it's all gone to mush. And now for the main event, chewing gum. Mmm, sounds promising. After three hours, when the fairy cake was mush, not a lot seems to have happened. And what about in 24 hours? Well, still not a lot. And this is hardly surprising, because the main ingredients of modern gums are likely to be wonderfully indigestible substances, such as polyethylene and polyvinyl acetate. And let's face it, we weren't designed to digest plastics. So what does happen to the gum? Well, 24 hours after being swallowed, it's usually gone on a little trip. Finally, on Experimental, meet Dr Victoria de Reicher, a linguist from Middlesex University in London. Her interest in language is rivalled only by an obsession with ducks. It's a combination that's sure to ruffle a few feathers. You see, Victoria has a theory that ducks have regional accents just like us. Humans have made an assumption that ducks quack in the same way all over the world. And I wanted to challenge that. Victoria, or Dr Quack to her friends, started by asking children across the globe to impersonate the sound of a duck. She found that an English child would say... Quack, quack. A Vietnamese child... Cab, cab. And an Italian child... Quack, quack. Most linguists put this down to language differences, but Dr Quack thought that maybe the ducks themselves had quacksants. On her trusty scooter, Dr Quack hunted down two geographically distinct duck populations for her study, the first of which was in the heart of London. I picked ducks in East London because I'm a Londoner myself and I feel that it's a really interesting accent. It's one you can very easily recognise and I wanted to see whether or not that might be paralleled in the animal world. Dr Quack's streetwise city ducks were here at Mudshoot City Farm in the east end of London. Ducks aren't keen on staying still at the best of times. And sure enough, as soon as Dr Quack brings out her microphone, it causes as much panic in the farmyard as a jar of hoisin sauce and a Chinese cookbook. With the city ducks recording, Dr Quack headed out of London to the rural village of Shatterling in Kent. But would the laid-back country ducks prove as unwilling to participate as their city counterparts? Ah, such a peaceful life. When the feathers settled, Victoria took time to analyse her recordings, and the results were surprising. So this is the rural duck. And this one is the urban quacking. The London ducks are incredibly raucous. They're very loud, they're very fast. They need to make each other heard, I think, or they need to be heard. Amongst each other, and also over the everyday sounds of the city, like planes, trains, traffic, and the hordes of people visiting the city farm. The rural ducks are much slower, they're very relaxed, they use a lot of lower register sounds so that it doesn't seem half so competitive. I think perhaps that's also due to the fact that the sound around them operates very differently. So it seems that Victoria's quacksant theory might be right. The differences in the way humans imitate ducks could well be down to the ducks themselves. Of course, regardless of accents, will we ever really know what ducks are saying to each other?